Good evening, everyone. I'm Sheila Coronel. I am Dean of Academic Affairs at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. And I'm also director of the Tony Stabil Center for Investigative Journalism at our school. I'm filling in tonight for Dean Steve Cole, who is unable to join us because he is in Brazil. Welcome to the 79th Maria Moore's Cabot Prizes, the oldest awards in international journalism. Each year, these prizes honor outstanding journalism in and about Latin America. Tonight's winners are journalists who have dedicated their careers to understanding and reporting on sometimes underreported, yet key parts of our hemisphere and our world, from Argentina to Brazil, Mexico, and Cuba. Welcome. I'd like to recognize some of the special people who are here tonight. Please stand and hold your applause, everyone, until all the people I call have been acknowledged. First, I'd like to welcome members of the Cabot family. Your leadership and continued support enables us to pay tribute to the best reporting to and about the Americas. Members of the Cabot family, please stand up. Next, I would like to welcome past Cabot winners, as well as members of the Cabot Board. The Cabot Board is a renowned group of scholars and journalists who contribute their expertise to choose our winners every year. We appreciate your many contributions. Cabot medalists and members of the Cabot Board, please stand up. And among the special people with us here tonight are our own journalism school students, who, especially international students, and the four Cabot scholars from Mexico, Ecuador, and Guatemala. I hope you get a chance to talk to these students tonight. They are a truly impressive group of people in a growing part of our community. Students, please stand up. Finally, we welcome members of the diplomatic community who are here with us tonight. We will not make you stand up, uh, but the first part of our program is dinner, so please enjoy your dinner, and I'll be back after dinner. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2017 Cabot Prizes. I would like to welcome you back to tonight's program. I hope you enjoyed your meal. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we do at the Journalism School. As Dean of Academic Affairs, I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the world of journalism and how, and how our own school is responding to it. We are, we are very much a global school. 40% of our students come from countries other than the United States. They come from over 40 countries all around the world. In recent years, we have taken a lot of effort to globalize our curriculum, including our teaching of what we call the journalism essentials. These are media law, media ethics, media history. In addition to that, we have classes on inter reporting on international human rights, reporting on women and migration, covering refugees, investigating national security, cross-border data journalism, and many more, all of them with a global focus. Increasingly, our faculty reflects our global outlook. We have faculty now who have done work in Asia, Latin America, Europe, and Africa. We have deep and enduring relations with Latin America. Two of our professors, 
Janina Sunini, who is here, is the night chair for data journalism. She's a star data and investigative journalist from... <laughs> Hi, Janina. She is well known for the work that she has done holding Speaking Truth to Power in Latin America. She's from Costa Rica and she joined us in the last, and she's been with us for three years. Daniel Ararcon also joined us three years ago. He is the founder and guiding light of Radio Ambulante, which is a podcast that does long form narrative radio journalism in Spanish for audiences both in Latin America, the United States, and elsewhere. Danielle's family is originally from Peru, but he grew up in the United States. <laughs> Many of our alumni in the journalism school do groundbreaking reporting in Latin America. Last March, we completed a two-week investigating recording course in Cartagena, the other Colombia. Um, together with the Fundacion Garcia Marquez. We had journalists from eight countries in, from Latin America attending, and we hope this will be an annual event. Dean Steve Cole, the dean of our school, is now in Brazil, where he spoke about Donald Trump and the press at the Piauí Global News Festival in Sao Paulo. I myself feel really close to Latin America, the Philippines, my home country, is like many of the countries in Latin America and a Spanish colony, an American neo-colony. Um, some people say we are in the wrong continent. Certainly I share the aspirations of my Latin American colleagues for a free and independent press and for protections that will allow us to do fact-based and evidence-based journalism that holds the powerful to account. There has never been a need for fact-based journalism as there is now. And so I thank the Cabot Prizes and the Cabot Board for recognizing that journalism is an honorable profession and that the free press, for all its faults, continues to be a staunch pillar of democracy in all our countries. As Joseph Pulitzer, the founder of our school said over 100 years ago, our republic and its press will rise or fall together. It is my privilege now to introduce our next speaker, the chair of the Cab Cabot Board. She is herself a former Cabot Prize winner for investigative reporting for the work she did at Semana, Colombia's leading news magazine. Today, she is director of the Open Society Foundation's program on independent journalism based in London. Please join me in welcoming my dear friend, Maria Teresa Ronderos. This is her final year of service to the jury of the Cabot Prizes. Thank you very much, Maria Teresa, for all that you've done. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to you, President Bollinger, Professor Cornell, and to the Cabot family for making this great celebration possible. Welcome all to the Maria Moore's Cabot Awards, a unique gala honoring superb careers in journalism that have contributed and continue to contribute to understanding in the Americas and what amazing careers we are celebrating tonight. But before I introduce you to the Cabot medalists of 2017, the jury wanted me to convey the sadness and the anger we feel to see so many journalists assassinated, disappeared, and forced into exile in Mexico this past year with absolute impunity. Miroslava Bridge, Salvador Adame, Javier Valdez, and only a few days ago, photographer Daniel Esqueda, all have gone in the last year. According to Article 19, in half of these cases, public officials were involved in the attacks. Many of these reporters were telling daring truths, but nothing seems to indicate that anyone 
will appreciate their sacrifice by finding the perpetrators or that anything will change. Earlier this evening, you saw a few of the profiles of the journalists killed in 2017 to help us remember that what is happening in Mexico is unacceptable. Tonight's winners remind us of the kind of journalism our continent should cherish and protect in Mexico and elsewhere. It is thanks to journalists like Dorit Harasim, Mimi Whitefield, Martin Caparros, and Nick Miroff that democratic aspirations and the fight for human rights are still very much alive in the Americas despite the many challenges. Dorit Harasim, an inspiration for women journalists in Brazil and throughout Latin America, has been founder of media, documentarian, columnist, who has told the story of the dramas that have shaped the Americas in the last five decades, decades in a beautiful and brave way. Mimi Whitefield, <clears throat> who has had the courage to cover Cuba with balanced and independent stories, making dogged and sensitive reporting speak stronger than prejudice. Martin Caparros, prolific writer, novelist, editor, and above all, a fiercely free spirit who has always spoken his mind, no matter the risks, be it about dictators, FIFA authorities, or the death penalty, like he did in that unforgettable story of Argentine Victor Hugo Saldano, who spent 20 years waiting to be killed by lethal injection in a Houston prison. Nick Miroff, for many years, covered Latin America for the Washington Post, telling reality as he finds it, even when it contradicts popular belief, like when he reported how peace with FARC in Colombia would make coca eradication harder, not easier. To all of them, a great congratulations. Finally, I want to ask for a big round of applause also to Abby Wright and Lauren Merejildo Santos for putting together this wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Teresa. Now it is my privilege to introduce the president of Columbia University, who will preside over the Cabot Prizes ceremony. He became Columbia's 19th president in 2002. He's a member of the Columbia Law School faculty and one of the country's foremost First Amendment lawyers. He comes from a family of journalists. and He's a well-known defender of press freedom and also a wonderful ally and supporter of the Journalism School, and for that, we are very grateful. Please join me in welcoming President Lee Bollinger. There are many events during the year uh, that um, I can attend at a great university. There's just a flowering of events every single day. This is one of the most important, and I want you to know that. I'm deeply moved by this event and honored to be here. So we come here together, as we do every year, to celebrate the achievements of brave individuals who are especially committed to the larger purposes of journalism. These are people who merit our admiration and respect. And this is always an inspiring occasion. But it is also an occasion tempered by the sober knowledge that people who engage in this work do so often at great personal risk. This year our gathering is especially poignant as we recognize and pay tribute to the life and work of someone who six years ago was present here in Lowe Library to receive the Cabot Prize, Javier Valdez. As many of you know, Javier 
was co-founder of the weekly newspaper Rio Doce, which we honored for its coverage in areas affected by drug trafficking. In May, because of his determination to carry on his work, Javier was murdered in broad daylight, not far from the paper's offices. He was just 50 years old. Javier was a friend to many of you in this room and a beacon for any journalist who shared his mission, exposing the brutal commonplace nature of Mexico's relentless drug violence. A prolific and gifted writer with a great sense of humor, Javier explored the human impact of living in what is tantamount to a war zone in his articles, columns, and books. He was unwavering in his commitment to his work, despite threats, the disappearances of sources, and his own fears. He was driven by the belief that to stop writing was to surrender, and he would not surrender. The same year that he was awarded the Cabot Prize, Javier, received the International Press Freedom Award from the Committee to Protect Journalists. His remarkable words that evening speak to just how heavily imperiled the situation in Mexico has become for journalists and for the average Mexican citizen. He said, quote, I've been a journalist these 21 years and never before have I suffered or enjoyed it this intensely nor with so many dangers. In Mexico, it is dangerous to be alive, and to do journalism is to tread an invisible line drawn by the bad guys who are in drug trafficking and in the government in a field strewn with explosives. The youth will remember this as a time of war. Their DNA is tattooed with bullets and guns and blood. And this is a form of killing tomorrow. We are murderers of our own future. In 2011, we gathered here and spoke with Javier and his colleagues about these risks. Impunity, bullying, surveillance, censorship, and violence. They are as real now as they have ever been. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, nine journalists have been killed so far this year in Mexico, making it the deadliest country in the world for the working press. It is now my privilege to invite to the podium Javier's colleague and friend and the co-founder of Rio Doce, Ishmael Bajorquez, to say a few words about Javier's legacy and the urgent need for an end to the violence in Mexico and the impunity that fuels it. Please welcome Mr. Bojarquez to the podium. Buenas noches a todos, gracias. Gracias a la Universidad de Columbia, a la Escuela de Periodismo y al jurado del Premio María Moscavos por llamar la atención sobre esta tragedia que vivimos de hace lustros, desde hace lustros en México, uno de los tres países en el mundo que registra más asesinatos de periodistas. Como lo dijo el presidente de la universidad, hace seis años estuve en este mismo foro. El jurado del Cabo decidió otorgarnos el premio y dijo que fue por dar aliento a reporteros excepcionales, entre comillas, en todo México, que se cuidan la vida, 
que se juegan la vida por la realización de su trabajo, especialmente en zonas afectadas por el narcotráfico. Pero no estuve solo. Me acompañó otro de los fundadores de Río 12, Javier Valdés, Javier Arturo Valdés Cárdenas, que un mes más tarde recibiría eh, un reconocimiento en esta misma ciudad por parte del Comité para la Protección de Periodistas, el CPJ, que dirigía nuestro amigo Carlos Lauría. Ahora es muy doloroso estar aquí sin él. El 15 de mayo pasado, dos gatilleros lo asesinaron cuando salían de la redacción. Ha sido una pérdida enorme para su familia, para sus amigos y para Río 12, pero también fue un golpe demoledor para el periodismo nacional, tan urgido de periodistas que narren la tragedia que viven miles de mexicanos, niños, jóvenes, hombres, mujeres, en cuyos corazones y sus miradas, Javier solía descubrir el horror y la desesperanza para luego descubrirlos, describirlos, perdón, con una prosa que disfrutaba y sufría al mismo tiempo. El crimen de Javier Valdés es la síntesis de la corrupción y la impunidad que imperan en el Estado mexicano. En esos 12 disparos, a las 12 del día de ese maldito lunes, se expresa la libertad con que alguien decide el destino final de otra persona con la seguridad de que nunca será castigado. Han pasado ya cinco meses de que lo asesinaron y no hay absolutamente ninguna pista sobre los autores materiales e intelectuales. Y en la misma situación se encuentran los asesinatos de 37 periodistas solo en el sexenio del presidente Enrique Peña Nieto. El, al drama de la violencia que acosa a los periodistas mexicanos hay que agregar la impunidad con que se cometen los crímenes, porque el 99% de los casos documentados con cifras oficiales no se castigan. Y de esta forma se reproduce el problema, porque el que mata o manda matar a un periodista, sabe que lo hará con plena impunidad. Un Estado no es legítimo si sus estructuras de prevención contra la violencia son rebasadas por las bandas del crimen, y menos aún cuando el sistema judicial está tan corrompido que en vez de ser garante del derecho es un instrumento de la criminalidad. En México se delinque, se delinque desde las madrigueras del crimen organizado, pero también desde las esferas públicas. Ha sido el propio gobierno quien ha protegido por décadas el crecimiento desmesurado del narcotráfico, que poco a poco en los municipios, en los estados y en el país se ha estado apoderando de vastas áreas del poder político. Este es el escenario en el que los periodistas mexicanos nos jugamos la vida todos los días, con el agravante de que en la guerra que cubrimos, los bandos no están plenamente identificados y el fuego proviene de todos lados. Después de que mataron a Javier Valdés, han seguido asesinando periodistas. Dijimos que esto iba a ocurrir mientras no se pusiera un alto a la impunidad, y no nos equivocamos. En agosto mataron al reportero Cándido Ríos en Veracruz, y el jueves pasado, mientras yo escribía estas líneas, fue levantado y asesinado el fotoperiodista Edgar Daniel Esqueda en San Luis Potosí. Su cuerpo fue encontrado un día después. 
De este último se sospecha que fue la misma policía la que cometió el crimen y es muy probable, porque en un alto porcentaje las agresiones a periodistas provienen de los mismos círculos policíacos y del poder político. Cuando vimos el impacto nacional e internacional que causó el crimen de Javier Valdés, tuvimos la esperanza de que fuera castigado, que los autores materiales e intelectuales fueran detenidos y juzgados. Pero todo indica que esto no ocurrirá y que los periodistas y la sociedad mexicana seguiremos aportando víctimas sin que nadie pueda evitarlo. Esa es la realidad, nuestra realidad, el contexto en el que tendremos que seguir trabajando porque un periodista no nace para el silencio. Si quiere ser congruente con el oficio, con el oficio de investigar y publicar. Y cito a Javier Valdés. No es un asunto de los periodistas, sino de todos los ciudadanos. Y hay que defenderlo. Y la manera y la mejor manera de hacerlo es ejerciéndolo. Es un derecho ciudadano, un derecho humano y vale la pena. En tiempos tan sombríos y convulsionados, levantar la palabra escrita y hablada que muchos nos quieren arrebatar para imponernos el silencio. Para mí, dijo Javier, dejar de escribir es morir, es dejar de caminar, de sentir, de experimentar la vida. El silencio es una forma de complicidad y de muerte. Y yo ni soy cómplice ni estoy muerto. Lo peor, se los digo ahora, es que esta cita fue extraída de un texto que Javier Valdés preparó para participar en un evento en Ciudad de México el 4 de junio y al que no pudo llegar porque 20 días antes fue asesinado. Quiero agradecer al jurado del premio Cabot en nombre de Río 12 y de los periodistas de mi país la condena que hicieron del crimen de Javier y el pronunciamiento para que el gobierno mexicano llevara a cabo una investigación exhaustiva y creíble de este crimen y ponga fin al círculo vicioso de violencia e impunidad que está diezmando a los medios mexicanos. Y también la oportunidad de estar ahora con ustedes denunciando el estado de barbarie que tenemos que ejercer uno de los derechos, en el que tenemos que ejercer uno de los derechos fundamentales en el mundo, como es la libertad de expresión, a costa de nuestras propias vidas. Muchas gracias y muchas gracias a todos. It is now time to award, to present the awards. Martin Caparros, please come to the podium. Our first medalist career embodies the core mission of these prizes, honoring journalists who make significant contributions to inter-American understanding. For decades, Argentinian writer Martin Caparros has been one of the main voices of Latin American literary journalism. A prolific reporter and author of novels and 15 books of nonfiction, he is also a columnist and editor who has published across the region. His most recent nonfiction book, El Hombre, Hunger, was the result of a multi-year odyssey in which he journeyed around the world to understand why hunger still persists in today's world. As a public intellectual, he has always been outspoken about what he regards as right and wrong. He did so as a very young man during the military dictatorship, and he has done so more recently. Throughout, he has managed to preserve his reputation for being honest, balanced, and rigorous. Martin Caparros, 
for your years of achievement and an outstanding body of work. The trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Morris Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Good night. They told me I had two minutes, so and I am, if anything, a good pupil, so it would, I won't take more than three. And three are going to be enough, so you can notice how that my English cannot, cannot last any longer than that. I should say, I want to say that I'm honored and humbled to share this prize with uh, Dorit Harazim and uh, Mimi Whitefield and Nick Miroff, and to share it with so many people that came before that I admire and respect, and I'm really happy to be a part of their history. And I'm very amazed to notice that the prize has been given this October the 10th uh, 2017, because it was the same day, October the 10th, but 50 years ago, day by day, that I remember to have been for the first time struck by the front page of a newspaper. I was just getting out of the, of the school, I, had, I was like 10 years old, and uh, I was in Buenos Aires, my hometown, and I saw front page of a newspaper saying, Murió el Che Guevara. It was just 50 years ago, half a century ago. And I was able to notice, I mean, we're not going to discuss here and now what this uh, life and death meant to each one of us, but I was already able to notice the lot of emotions that it arose. <clears throat> and I, I was like, able to feel that something came out of those words and those stories, I thought that I could understand them, and I read many articles about it. And so I began to think, I want to believe that it was at that moment that I began to think that I wanted to write them, not only read them. Uh, I want to think that it was like the mythical moment in which I decided I wanted to become a journalist. I did. But, or better or worse, and uh, 50, exactly 50 years later, I stand in front of you because of that. Um, as I said, I'm happy, I'm honored, and I'm, I just wanted to say, if it was possible to that child, 50, me 50 years ago, that it was worth it. Uh, but it's true that I have only spent my life doing it I haven't lost it, as Ismael was telling, and so many uh, of his comrades in Mexico uh, had. To work as a journalist is not always to put your life on the line, but it's worth it when it is, when you do it. You can do it, you can put your life on the line by putting it in risk and even losing it, as we heard. But you can also do it, do it by pledging it to years and years of efforts and more efforts, failures and more failures, and those rare satisfactions that from time to time, like tonight, remind you that there is also some good in it. So that, that is it. I think my three minutes are over. And so to the journalists that lost their lives for it and to the journalists that lived their lives for it. Salud. Gracias.
Dorit Harazim, please come forward. Dorit Horazim, over her distinguished career, has reported on the Americas across platforms, including print commentary and television documentaries. She is a gifted journalist and storyteller who immerses herself in her stories. Living with female prisoners in Rio de Janeiro for eight days and traveling thousands of miles with migrant workers from Brazil's Northeast. A lifelong news innovator she was at the creation of the first Brazilian Newsweekly magazine in 1968, and then 40 years later at the establishment of a new monthly magazine. As an international correspondent and editor, Harazim continues to be a keen analyst of the American scene for the readers of her weekly column at O Globo. During the darkest years of the military dictatorship in Brazil in the 1970s, she exposed human rights abuses, and she continues to cover social injustice and racism from a gender inequality perspective. Dorit Horazim, for your commitment to important stories over the course of a long and distinguished career, and for your dedication to journalism, covering the Americas across platforms, the trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Moore's Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations. Thank you to Columbia, President Bollinger, Maria Teresa Ronderos, and the brave, hardworking members of the jury. I'm very proud of being selected. And I'd like to just mention Rosenthal Alves, who had the crazy idea of putting my name in this. for this prize. Um, it's a wonderful feeling for me to be here tonight with Martin Caparros, Nick Mitov, and Mimi Whitefield. And Ismael's powerful words encourage me not to give up, although I belong to a slightly different species of journalists that most of us here, my tribe is close to extinction. Being just a few years younger than the Cabot Prize itself, whose first ceremony was in 38, I did nearly half of my reporting in the Middle Ages of the information era. No internet, no cell phones, no Google, or social media. Even credit cards weren't issued in Brazil until the 80s. You went on assignment with stacks of cash in your pockets. I remember running out of Monday once in Manama, capital of Bahrain, and couldn't pay the hotel. Communications were difficult, and when the financial guys in Sao Paulo finally answered my request, they had sent the money order instead to Panama, which sounded more real than Manama. They couldn't figure out what that was. Also in the 70s, when I went to Qatar, Kuwait, Tehran, and the then emerging 
United Arab Emirates. Brazilian diplomats were appalled that Veja magazine I worked for would send a Caucasian, non-Muslim, single young female reporter to conservative Islamic lands. Luckily, I had editors who understood the value of reporting with your own eyes and ears instead of repackaging news agency dispatches. Mostly, I'm glad to have learned early on to deglamorize our fictional role as heroes. We are just journalists, but that alone is enough. My first decade as a reporter in Brazil was a crash course in journalism under military regime. Only with the end of the heavy-handed censorship in 78 did I begin to experience the enormous responsibility of being a reporter with freedom of press. It can be quite inebriating to be allowed by law and trusted by society to investigate and denounce the powerful, to give visibility to the powerless, to be feared for being reliable and unflinching. To me, press freedom is to be cherished, not to be taken for granted. Amidst all the profound changes redesigning the media landscape, to witness journalism being attacked in the very country of the First Amendment is frightening. For the first time in four decades of reporting on the American scene, lately as a columnist at O Globo, the leading daily newspaper in Rio, I still wonder how come I didn't see the coming of such darkening times. On a personal note, I was five years old when I landed in Brazil aboard a US Army transport ship for displaced persons leaving Europe after the war. That exodus with people of all strands of life, different looks, habits, backgrounds, and behavior was my first exposure to human diversity. I marveled at seeing a black person for the first time in my life and attempted to communicate in Serbo-Croatian, my native tongue at the time, with a new Japanese neighbor. I managed somehow, because when there is will and need, we humans manage to communicate. Being an immigrant, this very otherness of mine became a gift for life. It emboldened me throughout my professional career to cross borders with less prejudice. I learned the value of listening. My writings, vision, interests, fights, and commitment as a reporter reflect this upbringing as an immigrant in a generous, imperfect, chaotic land. I suppose this is the right time and the right place here to stress that a society that fears otherness misses the full potential of life. Fear is contagious as much as courage. I'm thankful to my parents for having braved across the Atlantic. I'm lucky to share my beliefs with my husband of four decades, Elio Gaspari. And I do hope that our daughter Clara and our granddaughter Anna will have the chance of embracing a more tolerant world. Thank you very much.
Nick Miroff, please come to the podium. Nick Miroff's lively and eloquent stories show how people in Latin America are being buffeted by violence and political change. In the Amazon lowlands of Ecuador, he revealed how the construction of an oil pipeline fueled deadly rivalries among indigenous tribes. In northern Mexico, he observed through the eyes of an American priest the ravages in rural villages caught between feuding drug cartels. His prescient reporting foretold the rush of migrants from Central America to the United States and the rising death toll in illegal border crossings. While based in Mexico City and Havana, Miroff had a uniquely close view of the twilight of Castro's rule and the opening with the United States. Now starting in a new role at the Washington Post in Washington, he brings with him years of experience covering Latin America. Nick Miroff, for, for stories that made the region's transformations vivid and important for American readers, the trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Moore's Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations, Nick Miroff. Thank you. Um, I'm pretty sure I had the shortest trip to get here. I moved with my family back to Washington about six weeks ago after eight years as a correspondent in Latin America. I've been used to writing in flip-flops with tropical foliage out the window, and now I have a workstation and a growing rotation of Macy's dress shirts. It's a good thing Post uh, Foreign Editor Doug Gell is here tonight so I can start lobbying him for my old job back. I want to thank him for keeping me out there all of those years and for giving me the freedom to roam far and wide. Also my editor, Mary Beth Sheridan, who is here, who always challenged me to make stories better. I'm grateful to the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, to Dean Steve Call and President Bollinger and to the members of this year's jury, whose work has been an inspiration to so many of us. My family is here, Dad and Melinda, who have been reading my stories since kindergarten without a single negative review, and my wife, Camila, uh, who put up with all of those trips and absences and times when the kids were sick and I was off somewhere in the Amazon. I want to say a few words tonight about the lethal threats facing our colleagues in Mexico and elsewhere where journalism is literally practiced under a gun. I didn't know Javier Valdez well, but I spoke to him several times over the years. He was one of the reporters that I held in awe but also feared for. There aren't many like him left. In too many places, and especially in Mexico, guns are speaking louder than words. Bullets have become the most powerful editing tools. They have a terrible power to twist the truth or to erase it altogether. And when no one protects reporters like Javier, journalism is not possible. And we will all be poorer and less informed and more blind because of it. The Mexican government and the United States have a shared responsibility to make the killing stop now. Over the years, uh, people often ask me what it was like to work in places like Nuevo Laredo or Michoacan or San Pedro Sula if it was scary. 
and it was at times, but I always had the luxury of flight. I could cross the border back to safety or skip town. What's really frightening is when you can't leave the place you're working because it's your home. Foreign correspondents get to come and go, but it's the reporters like Javier and Ismael and their families who have to live with the consequences of journalism. It takes incredible courage, and I think we can honor it best by making sure that reporting and truth-telling is not silenced, and that the cowards who kill journalists cannot do so with impunity. Thank you. Mimi Whitefield, please come to the podium. Amy Whitefield has dedicated her career to reporting and editing the region's most important stories, from guerrilla movements in South America in the 1980s, drug trafficking and violence across a generation, and the social and economic transformation of the continent. But perhaps Whitefield's most significant contribution to inter-American understanding has been her standout coverage of Cuba at the Miami Herald. For years, she has painstakingly explained Cuba with depth, balance, and an eye for detail during periods when it was difficult for an American reporter to work in Cuba, and more recently during the historic opening between Washington and Havana. She wrote an in, in an intense environment in southern Florida where passion about Cuba runs deep. Yet Whitefield always maintained a fair and informed sense of authority. Mimi Whitefield, for dedicating your career to covering the Americas and for your tireless commitment to the region, the trustees of Columbia University are honored to present you with the Mariah Moore's Cabot Gold Medal. Congratulations, Mimi Whitefield. Thank you to the Cabot Board, Columbia University, and the Cabot family, as well as the Miami Herald, the newspaper that has allowed me to report from almost every country in the Americas. This prize is, it's really the ultimate for any reporter who cares deeply about Latin America. And I'm honored to share the stage with such distinguished recipients. Dorit, Nick, Martin. No matter where I've reported from, I've always felt like a daughter of the New World. And what's made covering Latin America so fascinating for me has been that it's a region of endless possibilities, one that's still in the process of becoming. And what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is access for journalists and who has the right to tell a country's stories. For many years, I've been a Miami-based correspondent covering Cuba. And Cuba has always tightly controlled the access um, of foreign journalists, especially those who live in Miami. When I began to cover the island in the early 1990s, 
Foreign reporters were always assigned constant companions from the Ministry of Foreign Relations. I got to see a wide swath of official Cuba that way. But in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba's main benefactor at the time, visas began to dry up. I went anyway, traveling as a tourist via third countries, and I got to see a very different Cuba on those trips, one where young people were pushing the envelope, Cubans were taking small steps to start their own businesses, and dissidents were growing bolder. And it, it went on like that until the Cuban government asked me to leave during one of those reporting trips and made it very clear that I would not be welcome again unless I had a proper journalist visa. I didn't get one for the next 17 years. I covered other things in other places during the interim, and it wasn't until 2012 when Pope Benedict visited Cuba that that long visa drought ended. Since then, access has improved not only for me but other reporters, especially after the 2014 opening between the United States and Cuba. But it is still not easy for all Miami reporters to get visas. So who, who really loses when access is cut off? Well, first of all, it's readers who don't get a complete story. When you're not on the ground, you miss telling details, nuances, the overall mood of a country, and the ability to meet new so sources. And the argument I've always made to Cuban officials is that when reporters don't have access, they lose their opportunity to tell their side of the story in a more meaningful way. There are some in the Cuban government who do understand this, and I, I thank them for it. Others prefer to circle the wagons. Covering Cuba also presents its own set of challenges in Miami. There is no U.S. community that cares as passionately about Cuba. But sometimes that passion manifests itself in the belief that there is only one correct view of the island, and that is the exile view. That's why it's, it's so important to bring as many points of view as possible to this complicated and, and layered story. And that's impossible to do without access. During my years of covering Cuba, my best collaborators have always been the Cuban people. They have shared their lives and their stories, sometimes at considerable personal cost. So I would like to dedicate this prize to them, the people of Cuba, who I'm absolutely confident have the capacity to forge their own better future. As a journalist, you can never convince me that talking isn't a good thing. And I am convinced that two sides that have talked past each other for so many decades should try to engage and talk out their differences. In recent weeks, we have seen a setback in U.S.-Cuba relations. That's why it's so important, more important than ever, to keep the lines of communication open. And access for journalists is a very large part of that. Thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias. Muito obrigada.